grace. 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 Okay, now we've been talking about pursuing relational knowledge of Jesus for weeks now. And uh, the purpose of this pursuit, um, other than the, the pure bliss of actually knowing him is, uh, in true intimacy, is that it works uh, to make, um, uh, makes us like him. That's the end game is by hanging around him and, and getting to know him on a relational level, we become like him. Uh, we've learned that what primary, primarily fuels this pursuit um, is hunger for God. Uh, not only desiring him, but requiring him. You know, as we sang this morning, uh, I, I'm desperate for you, or in the song uh, that we, after that, uh, running, out, running after you, we sing the lyrics, hope calls to hope deep in my bones, there's an agony, I'm aching for you, and nothing else will do, my soul thirsts for you. Until we require him, not just desire him, but require his presence, require encounters with him, um, you know, it, it be, we have limited limited exposure to intimacy with God based upon how hungry we are. Uh, it, but, you know, that we have it on good authority from the scripture that if we draw near to him, he will draw near to us. Amen. But, you know, there's there's drawing near and there's drawing near. There's in other words, there's showing up and there's being hungry. Right. And there's also there's between the, and there's even a step deeper than that. And that is uh, having having to have him. Out of absolute necessity, because you're parched, you're hungry, you're thirsty, you're you need him. Amen. That's requiring him. You know these words in praise to God are, are appropriate and find similar refrains in the words of the songs written by the psalmist in Scripture. When you hear him talking about you know uh, um, aching for him and having souls thirsty for them and and being desperate for God, these are words that the psalmist used and they sang in praise to God. Thousands of years ago, so they they're appropriate, you know. Finally, last week I introduced the fact that this hunger for God comes at a cost. Uh, the cost of hunger is a laying aside of all other loves and lovers in preference of Him. These loves and lovers include the uh, the greater categories of earthly possessions, the esteem of others, intellectual pursuits, sins, and other people. And all the other sins fit into those larger categories, you know. Uh, and, and we're 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 going to to ease our way deeper into this a little today because we want to pay attention uh, to what has to be paid, what kind of a price has to be paid, and we want to pay whatever price has to be paid. Amen. That's necessary to know Him more completely and thereby therefore be transformed into His likeness. I believe the first and most important step we can take is the one which is always immediately in front of us, that next step. As such, we're going to look today at the cost of living in the light of what we already know. You know, I, I'm reminded of when my generation, and I'm sure not everybody's parents were like mine, uh, but, uh, you know, I wanted to move on to the next thing. And often I had not finished what I was already in the middle of. Uh, that could have been an, a project. That could have been what's on my plate. It could have been any number of things. And the word of wisdom that was given to me is, when you finish this, we can move on to the next thing. Right? But, you know, I'm not moving on to the next thing until you're done with what you're doing. Right? And I, and I'm, I can't say categorically that, that that's always the way it works in the spirit. But I believe that there's, I, I believe that there's a level in which that is more often the truth than not. If we haven't been faithful over the word that God's already given us, the revelation he's already given us of his son, then it's very unlikely that you're going to grow much into another revelation. Why would God expend more and be and give more to you and entrust more of a Because re- you need to understand, like I've said before, and I've, I've tried to build on this, this whole teaching, uh, you know, brick upon brick, and one of the bricks we've laid is how valuable this knowledge of Jesus is. It's valuable. And God understands how precious his son is. God the Father understands how precious knowledge of the living word is. And so he doesn't just hand that out to anyone. Not even to any of his kids. Just because you're a child doesn't make you a shoe in 
If you're not hungry for it, then he's like, you know what? If you're not hungry, I mean, I, I, you tell me. You got you. You put some effort into making food for someone. You know, are, are you all that eager to put it on the plate if you know they're really not even hungry? Why go through the effort? I mean, you put you put valuable time and money and energy into making this, and if they're not even hungry, why waste it on them? If it's just going to wind up in the garbage, ninety percent of it anyway, why bother? Are you understand what I'm saying? I mean, I there, I think there's a. a, a frugality about this on one level and i think there's just an honoring of the father to the son that forbids his heart from just spilling out things about christ to children that are going to take it flippantly take it casually you know what i mean yes ma'am is there what it means when it says uh casting your pearls before swine that's one of the things it's referring to yes ma'am uh-huh yes because, uh, I mean, uh, one of the other things is, he says, because they'll rise up and rend you with it. Uh, it. You know, sometimes when you pour out your heart before people, they just use it as a way of coming back. And uh, as a, um, uh, now they, they know what touches your heart. Now they'll use it against you. Um, and, and God's not concerned about something to be used against him. He's, he's incapable of being used. But at the same time, you know, uh, the concept is, is, is similar. Yes, ma'am. You know, why Why give all this, especially the most precious thing that can be given to people who are not going to show deference and, and respect for it. Amen. And I think that is as much, if not more true for his children than it is for the lost. Because at least you and I have a frame of reference for honoring that knowledge. The world doesn't. The world's like, prove it to me. You know, they don't realize who they're dealing with. You know, all of us before we met Christ might have had a little bit of a cocky attitude, but once we've come to him and we know him better now, we despise that cockiness. We 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 hate that we ever might have ever thought that way because we know he's so worthy and he's so um, high and exalted and we so adore him and we are so humbled before him that we're embarrassed that we ever had thoughts like that. You know what I mean? But the world, they're just... They're blind and they're cocky, you know, they don't know any better. Uh, and, and, and you kind of put up with that. And I think God will, will deal with that for a while with, with the, the children of the enemy because he's being gracious towards them. But, you know, you and I ought to know better. You know the difference? You know what I mean? I, 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 can you hold on to that just for a second? I, I remember that times also when I was growing up when I'd have a friend over, especially the first time a friend had ever been here. And, uh, uh, they were, they might do some stuff, and because we're all getting all caught up, I, I'll do something that they do, and I knew better. They didn't, right? This is this is first time they've been in this house. You know, they don't know the rules here. I do, and my my mom or my dad might correct me, and I'm like, well, so and so did it, and they're like, yeah, but you know better, right? You live here, you know better. Let the first Terry, and then you can you hold on to that. Yeah, Terry, go ahead. Just thinking about the first things kind of mind value when we dinner and all that stuff was just done you know you don't use your fine china with just anybody mm -hmm. you use the fine china with somebody who understands this is an important thing mm -hmm. they're gonna they're gonna be careful with it you know you don't want to have it with the children who are just going to use the fried china like frisbees yeah you know they're they don't understand the value of it that's right absolutely very good or with the, the the swine you know they're going to look at the skull like their food they don't know the difference they don't have a clue how valuable this little round thing is you're throwing at them. It's, yeah. They don't understand the value of it. That's right. And that that's everything. You're right. That's right. Uh, Stephen, and then you had something too. Go ahead, Stephen. Another reason why a parent wouldn't correct the other one is they're not theirs. That's true. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to correct someone else's kid. It's mm -hmm. not my kid. Mm -hmm. So just by, being, or just by the fact that you're being corrected yeah. shows... Important. You belong. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. And you had something? No? Okay. So, you know, I believe that the first and most important step that we can take is one that's right in front of us, and that is being faithful over what we already know. You know, um, what's been entrusted to us and what God has honored us in knowing Jesus. Uh, and, and, and we're told in the book of James, and we're going to turn there in a minute, that, you know, that, that God honors us with more revelation of Christ if we're faithful over what we have. So we know that there's at least a level which is true. I'm not, I, I want to be careful and not turn it into a hard and fast rule because God's greater than rules. Uh, the, you know, 
I think that maybe 95% of the time it works this way, but that doesn't mean that every once in a while God may not give you knowledge when you were not faithful over the last knowledge. He might choose to give you more anyway for a specific reason, his own purposes. So I don't want to be, you know, gridlock is in saying that it can never happen. I'm just saying that by and large, it probably won't. Okay. So now the cost we pay in this arena is often called suffering because it requires a death. There's a method behind what Christ, um, uh, behind what of Christ is revealed to you. Because, you know, as each step of our, each step that we take in Christ, God chooses to reveal a portion of Christ, a, per, a part of who he is to us as individuals for us to take our next step into his image. So each revelation provides light for your next personal step into his likeness. And that's going to be different for each one of us. I mean, uh, we're, say, say, if you could, if you could be as, as, uh, as, if you could over naturalize this enough to say that, say, uh, that, like for me, my, my tenth step into Christ was God revealing this or something about the Lord Jesus to me in my personal life. And that was my light for my next step that invited me into becoming more like him. My tenth step may not be the same revelation as yours. God is tailoring this, each one as an individual to his children, because he knows who you are and where you are. Okay. He knows my weaknesses and he knows my strengths. Right. And so he's going to tailor this before it's all said and done. I'm going to know Jesus completely. But what part of him is revealed to me is based upon God's knowing of me as his son. God's knowing of you as a son or his daughter. And he tailors that revelation so that it best facilitates you being conformed into Christ's image. Does that make sense to you? Okay. So when that light comes, with it comes temptation, opposition, persecution to slow down or completely stop your progress of transformation into his image. So if you turn with James, uh, James uh, turns with me to James, the first chapter, starting in verse 2, James chapter 1, starting in verse 2, it says, My brothers and sisters, count it nothing but joy when you fall into all sorts of trials. Now the word trial there, if you were to look it up, is the same word to, as, as the word that's translated temptation in verse 12. They're the exact same Greek word. So really, and if you read this in, in context from beginning to end, which we're not going to do today, but if you were to read the whole chapter, it would probably be more appropriate to translate this word here, trials, translated as temptations. Okay? But either way, it's an opposition against your faith. We get that, right? Okay? So he says, my brothers and sisters, count it nothing but joy when you are lay prey by various trials or oppositions against your faith or temptations. And this is why. Because you know that this testing of your faith produces endurance. But let endurance have its perfecting effect so that you may become perfect and complete and not deficient in anything. Now, <clears throat> what is this perfect effect that he's talking about that endurance brings? What perfecting effect is that? Well, keep your finger there, and you can turn with me if you want to, but we're coming right back here. You can just let me read it to you if you like. We're going to look at Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 4. Okay? I want to find out what this, this patience, what this endurance will produce in me. Okay? I'm going to read it again, <clears throat> and then I'm going to skip over to Romans to define it. Okay? He says, My brothers and sisters, count it nothing but joy when temptations come against you, essentially. Now, this is not what you're going to want to count it. Hello? You're not going to want to count it joy. It doesn't feel joyous. When something is opposing your faith, when something is opposing your progress, when something is questioning what you know of Christ, that doesn't feel like a good thing. And God, that's why God is telling you, you have to make a deliberate execution of your will to count it joy. In fact, nothing but joy. And the reason why is because joy is rooted in relationship. And if you have your eyes on the temptation, on the opposition, on the, on the, uh, the, the trial, and not on what the trial is about, you'll fail. Do you hear me? It, it, remember getting the picture again out in the wilderness when, out because of judgment, God sent serpents out among 
the the Israelites. Remember that, and they were they were around their feet and they were they were biting them, and some of the people were swelling up and dying because these were venomous vipers, right? And uh, and of course the the you know God uh, you know Moses wanted to intercede for the people and and he went before God and God said well make a um a, a, a brazen pole with a with ser- with a serpent on it well you you know you don't just pop one of those out that takes time right I mean even if you had a three D printer at the time it would still take a better portion of a day right he had to craft a brazen serpent on a pole doesn't happen in an afternoon so people are dying left and right. And he's making this thing. And then he brings it out and he holds it up in front of them. And he makes the proclamation that whoever will look at the brazen serpent on the pole, though they are bitten, they will not die. And the illustration was there to, and that's where we get the pharmaceutical and uh, the uh, symbol, by the way, um, is that brazen serpent on the pole. That's where we get it from. Um, but, but I want you to understand that the issue was he's trying to draw their attention to the idea that if you are constantly trying to bat the things off of your feet, your attention is not where it belongs. It needs to be here, right? Now, Jesus, I mean, remember the, uh, a serpent is a type of Satan or a type of sin. Jesus became the brazen serpent on the pole, didn't he? He was the one that was lifted up. And if I am lifted up, I will draw all men to him myself. He became, he who knew no sin, became sin for me. Became, because remember, brass is a type of sin. Gold is a type of deity, right? Godliness. So Jesus became the brazen serpent on the pole, didn't he? And so our attention needs to be on him, not on these other things. So when you have trials, temptations, oppositions coming against you, you need to count it relational joy. This, I know at the end of this, I'll be closer to you. And because of that, I have joy welling up in my heart, though right now I'm enduring a temptation, a trial, an opposition against my trust. But if my attention is now shifted to the temptations at my feet, you will be bitten, you will swell up, and you will die. Period. Because your attention's not where it belongs. The devil doesn't deserve that much of your attention. There's only one person that deserves your attention. Amen? And that's where we place it. Amen? So he says, My brother and my, my brothers and sisters counted nothing but joy when you fall uh, into various sorts of trials because you know that this testing of your trust in Christ produces endurance. But let that endurance have its perfecting effect so that you become perfect and complete and deficient in nothing. So what is this perfecting effect? Well, Romans 5 tells us. Romans 5 verse 1 through 4 says, Therefore, since we have been declared righteous by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom we also have obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of God's glory, in the hope of the expectation of the glory of God. Because the glory of God is going to be revealed in you and I, isn't it? That is our hope, Christ in us, our hope of glorification. So he says, he says though through whom we have obtained um, access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in our expectation of Christ being formed. And this is what this means. Not only this, but we also rejoice in sufferings. Just like James was saying, when trials and temptations come against you, count it nothing but joy, right? He said, but not only this, we also rejoice in sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, same endurance James brought up, but Paul takes this a little bit further. He says, and endurance appro- uh, um, produces approved character. A change of heart. I become like him. That's the perfecting effect. Are you following me? The perfecting effect is my character changes. I become like him. And once I become like him, what happens? The cycle starts all over again. I'm given more expectation. He says, what's it say here? He says, not only this, but rejoice in sufferings, knowing that our suffering produces endurance, and endurance approved character, and approved character, hope. Amen? You remember what we talked in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, where it talks about the old covenant and how it brought condemnation and death. 
But the new covenant is so different from the old covenant because even though both of them had glory, the difference with the new covenant is the new covenant excels in glory. It grows in glory. You're going from glory to glory by the work of the Spirit of the Lord where you go from one level of like Christness, Christness to the next level of becoming more like Christ. Amen? And you're progressively becoming more and more and more like Him, excelling more and more and more in glory. Amen? That's right. So, but this, so this is a cycle that takes place. But it starts off with hope. And then when hope comes, hope is, a, is that, that rhema, that deposit that God makes in your heart, that revelation of Jesus. And it gives you hope, this expectation that I'm going to be like this Jesus that I see. And as you place your faith in Christ, working that reality through you, as that is happening, opposition comes against you and you suffer right? And in that suffering, you have to endure, don't you? You have to you have to press through it and say, it doesn't matter what's coming against us. I'm holding on to that image that I have of Christ. That image is going to be perfected in me. And as you press through that, it produces approved character. And once Jesus has been formed in you in that new area, what do we start off with again? The cycle starts all over again. We're rung, one rung higher on the ladder. We start back over with hope again. So you go from hope to faith, to suffering or trials, to endurance, to approved character, back to hope again. And it just keeps on going this way and going this way, corkscrewing upwards towards Christ's likeness over and over and over until one day Christ is fully formed in you. Amen? So that's the cycle that we're going through. So he says, and so, so the perfect effect James was mentioning is approved character. So with that in our understanding, let's go back to James and finish what, reading what he has to say, okay? But that, 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 that cycle ends with Christ in me. So we're picking up now down in verse 12. James chapter 1, verse 12. It says, Blessed is the man who endures these trials, because when he has passed the test, he will receive the crown of life. He will be honored with knowing God greater. And that is what God has promised to those who love him. Amen? God's promised that. No one undergoing trial should ever say, I've been tempted by God, because God is not tempted by evil, and he himself doesn't tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when he's drawn away and enticed by his own evil desires. They don't want to have to look far to tempt you away from the image that God has revealed to you. It's already inside of you. He just uses the desires you already have and says, don't you want this more than Christ being formed in you? Don't you want this more than Jesus? Don't you value this more than? Are you following what I'm saying? Yes or no? You guys with me? So he says, then desire, after it's conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is fully grown in you, it gives birth to separation, to death. Don't be deceived, my dearly bro beloved brothers. Every generous act and every perfect gift is from above, Coming down from the Father of lights, with him there is no variation, not in if shadow cast by turning. By his own choice, he gave us a new birth by the message of truth, so that we would be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. A bunch of key words in here. We're going to see them in another passage in a moment. He says here, that uh, the, he talks about the father of lights. There's no shadow of turning in him. By his own choice, he gave us a new birth by the message of truth. First John, we're going to read in a minute, talks about the message that was given to us. And he says, so that, we got that message of truth, so that we would be a kind of first fruits of his kind of creatures. So, not only what we come to know about God is important, but more important than that is what we already know about him. What are we doing with that knowledge of him which has already been granted to us? What are we doing with it? Are you sitting on it? Are you requiring that God make that part of your character? that God can form you to that image that you see. That's part of my hunger for him. It's not just a hunger for knowing Jesus. It's a hunger for knowing Jesus so that I might be share in the image that I see. Are oh, you see what I'm saying? I, part of this requires us to press through the veil of the flesh. The Bible talks about going in the, behind that presence, uh, the, behind, going to the presence behind the veil where, where Jesus has already gone, our forerunner, who is the author and, uh, the, and, and he's a, he's an anchor, uh, steadfast and sure for our hope. 
the, of Christ being formed in us, that we need to press through that veil. On the, now, the, the real veil, the thing that, re, that, that eternally separated us from God has been removed by the blood of Jesus Christ. But the scriptures, the scriptures suggest that there's still a metaphorical veil that's still there. And that veil is your flesh. The veil has always been the flesh, period. The veil has always been the flesh. Remember, the Bible says that that he uh, he uh, he um, uh, that he uh, he tore the flesh. Uh, he tore the um, the veil away, which is to say, his flesh. Right, the veil that separated us from God was human flesh, and Jesus' human flesh was torn, that the veil might be torn. In reality, now there's nothing blocking our access to God except for what you erect from your flesh. Because the flesh is still a veil. I'm still looking through a glass dimly because of the flesh. There's a day, there's a day coming when this flesh will no longer be that obstacle anymore. And I will see and gaze upon my Lord face to face. Amen. But that day's not today necessarily. At least it's not this hour right now. Right. And so what do I need to do? I have to press through the flesh to see the face of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I've got to value it enough to tear that flesh if necessary. Are you following me? There's suffering involved. There's a death that has to take place. And so what are we doing with the knowledge that we already have, what's already been granted us? Do we so deeply value and are we so humbled and grateful that God the Father saw fit to reveal anything about Jesus to us that, that we are literally on our knees saying, Father, I, re I don't just desire, I require that that image of Jesus that I see be formed in me. I'm not going to be a passive observer of Jesus. I'm going to become like the Jesus I see. And I'm willing to go through whatever it is that gets me from here to there. You need to understand, God is not creating these obstacles for you. They are there because you've got flesh. Period. Okay? God's willing to press through that flesh with you. Jesus had to die outside the city alone. You don't. Amen? You don't die alone. You die with him. Amen? What did Paul call it? The fellowship of his sufferings. There was no fellowship when Jesus suffered. It was just suffering. And he suffered alone. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But you and I don't ever have to say that. In the middle of our suffering, we can say, my God, my God, thank you that you never leave me and you never forsake me. Amen? Amen. We don't have to suffer alone. In fact, some of the greatest moments of intimacy you will ever have with Christ will be on that cross. I said some of the greatest moments of intimacy you will ever have in this life with Jesus will be on that cross. Which is why Paul said, you know what? Much gladly, therefore, I will glory in my weaknesses because it's right there that I'm united with Christ in the street that's made perfect in me. Right? Okay, so now I want you to uh, turn with me to 1 John. So here in James, God the Father is referred to as the Father of Lights, which is interesting because here in 1 John chapter 1, where we're headed, John also makes a similar observation of the Father. 1 John chapter 1, starting in verse 1. We're only writing 10 verses. 1 John chapter 1, verse 1. This is what we proclaim to you, what was from the beginning. So in other words, he's saying, what we are proclaiming to you is God who existed from before time. That's what he's saying there. And what we, he said, what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked upon and our hands have touched concerning the word of life. I was just, you know, I was just talking to Terry the other day when we were um, on our way to uh, the Strawberry Festival. And, uh, and we were talking about some, some things and I was bringing up how this one, uh, person on, on Facebook had put up something about, uh, the unreliability of the word and they were going to bring up all these councils, this council of Nicaea and the council of this council of that and how they, they hand selected books and that there's no reason to trust why we have the books we have in our Bible. And I'm like, and I told her, I said, I just, I, it's astounding to me, the Christian responses, when you read the Christian responses to posts like this, because Christians have no idea why we have the books we have. I'm like, how could you be a Christian and not know how we have the books that 
that we have. And uh, and but evidently this is a common thing. So I'm just going to go say it now to you guys. So if you don't know, you will know. Okay. And, and it's touched upon right here by James. Uh, I'm sorry, by John. The books that are in our Bible were selected because they have a direct, immediate line to apostolic authority. The people that wrote these words and the word that, the, the source that these words came from are eyewitnesses of Jesus. It's not second, third, fourth hand. There's a reason why some, there's no testimony received and included in our Bible that was written after 100 AD because all the, the disciples, the apostles, did die before then. Every book in the New Testament, the words that were written, they were written before the end of the first century within the lifetime of the Jesus they're talking about, and the words were directly from apostles. They have apostolic authority. That's why they're there. You realize there's other books. There's actually a third book of... I'm not talking about the very, very first book of Corinthians that we know we don't have, because when you read 1 Corinthians, it says, in my first letter, so we know there's a letter before that one. We're not talking about that one. There's actually a third letter past what we call 2 Corinthians. And everything in it is completely consistent with the Bible. Everything in it. There's nothing wrong in it. It's a great book. I would encourage Christians to read it and be inspired by it. But they refuse to include it in the Bible because it was not penned by an apostle. Everything's accurate. There's nothing wrong. You can't find anything that's not written in any other book. It would be a great book to have in the Bible, but they refuse to put it in there because it did not have immediate apostolic authority on it. That's why we have what we have. It's reliable. That's why we, we have what we have. And John's saying, you know what? I'm giving you the message to you guys because I'm someone who walked with the guy who's been from the beginning, Jesus himself. I'm telling you what I have heard, what I've seen with my eyes, what I've looked upon, and my hands have handled. This isn't second, third, fourth hand testimony. I was there. I know what I'm talking about. Right? Do you see what I'm saying? That's why it has authority. And, you know, you might think, you know, well, you know, well, you know, why, how do we know that their testimony is true? They could have made this up. Well, that's, that's a ridiculous idea because these guys are in a position to know whether what they were saying was a truth or a lie and they were willing to die for it. You know, there's a lot of people that, that are in the Muslim faith and in Islam and other places like that that are willing to die for their faith because it's faith. They believe it's true. These guys were in a position to know whether it was true. If they had died and had been a lie, they were on purpose willing to give their life up for a lie. Nobody's going to do that. Certainly not die the death they died. They died terrible deaths. You think they were willing to die just, uh, just to maintain the fact, okay, uh, you know, sure, I'll die. I just don't want you to think I'm a liar. Uh, no, I don't think so. They knew this was real and they were willing to die for it. They had been there. They saw, they touched, they heard. That's the testimony we have. Amen? There's a guy named Bert Erdman. Sick freak. Um, sorry, but he is. Um, he used to be a, a, a Bible-believing Christian and deep knowledge of theological truths. But And there's a story behind the story that I'm not going to get into today. I don't have time for it. I don't remember it in perfect clarity. But there's he has skin in the game of not wanting the Bible to be true. Let's just say that. Um, but in the end, even now, though he's a great opponent to the scriptures, even he says that he knows that the books that are in our Bible were picked for a real good reason. That they have a direct apostolic authority. Even he says that. So when your enemies agree with that, you know you've got something. You know what I'm saying? There's a reason why we've got what we've got. It's reliable. It was written and it was conferred by people who saw and touched and handled the word of life, Jesus Christ. Amen. This is first-hand testimony. He says, verse 2, he says, The life was revealed, and we have seen and testify and announced to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was revealed to us, apostles. What we have seen and heard, we are announcing to you so that you, so that, so that, so that, this is intention, so that you may have fellowship with us 
And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. What is he saying by extension there? If you can have fellowship with us, then by extension, you're also going to be having fellowship with the God that we have fellowship with. This is a family. Amen? He says, we have seen and heard what we've seen and what we have heard we announce to you so that you may have fellowship with us and indeed our fellowship, and that word fellowship is that you might have a shared experience with. That's koinonia, right? A shared experience with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. Thus we are writing these things so that our joy may be made complete. Their joy is made complete when you have fellowship. Amen? He says, now this is the gospel message that we heard from him. I told you that gospel message. We just mentioned it in the last chat in, in James, right? Well, here it is again. He says, now this is the gospel message we heard from him and announced to you. God is light. And in him, there is no darkness at all. Now, that might not rattle your cage upon first hearing it, okay? You may not understand how profoundly important that is, but it is terribly important. In fact, this is one of the primary axioms of the Christian faith right here. God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Very strong language, by the way, in the Greek. It highlights the eternal, absolute nature of God as pure and unalterable and unchanging. God is absolute light and in and there is no dark, darkness in him, none whatsoever. We have, with our human eyes, never seen 100% pure light. We've never seen it. Never. Light, as it is expressed in the natural creation, which is different, because God is a spirit, isn't he? And he dwells in the spiritual realm, isn't he? This is the natural realm, okay? And we have natural light that God's created. And undoubtedly, that natural light is a way of expressing to us what spiritual light looks like, okay? But they're not the same thing. Are you following what I'm saying? This is natural. That's spiritual. They're not the same thing, okay? I don't know how they're different, but they're different, okay? Now, light, as it is expressed in this natural creation, is an actual, is a spectrum. It's a huge spectrum. In fact, I, I brought a picture of it, which now, of course, my the TV's off, so you can't see it. I'll see if I can't bring it up real quickly. Come on now. There you go. Right there. That right there is a whole spectrum of light. All of that is light. All of it is. That. Oh, Jesus Christ. Where's the pause button? There. I didn't think it would move off of it because there's nothing else to go to. So that's the full spectrum of light. As far as we know. Yeah, as far as we know, we actually know that it probably goes deep in both directions, but this is what we know so far. That right there is what we can see with our eyes. That little tiny sliver, that's all we can see. But the rest of it, all of it's light. All of it is. All of it is. But that little bit's all we can see with our human eyes. Okay? That That's a great illustration, by the way, of the fact that... Uh, what you know of God and what there is of God are two big different things, right? Amen? Is that what you were going to essentially say? Or? Well, it just made me laugh because it just, you know, it was dawn on you moments, but his first words of let there be light is so yes. bigger than we ever are. Yeah, <laughs> quite honestly, I don't want to get derailed too much, but this is probably what God meant when he said let there be light. He was creating the electromagnetic spectrum because he didn't make the sun and the moon until many days later. Okay, this is probably what he meant, the electromagnetic spectrum. Without this, you could have made a sun and light wouldn't have traveled from point A to point B. You have to have this intact before light can even travel. Okay, so he had he made this, let there be light. And there was light, right? But and I don't want you to get too caught up in that, but it's just as a natural illustration to this. So even the natural light is something which in our current form, as mortal human beings, we can't even see most of it with our eyes. Most of it, our eyes are incapable of seeing. Some parts of that spectrum, if we were exposed to them for long periods of time, would kill us. 
Whereas the, and there's some exceedingly small areas on the far end of that spectrum that if you, if you were exposed to it for even a second, you would die. So even in its presence, you would die. It's kind of like what God says that no man can see God and live. God is light. Now, natural light is only part of this creation, and it is therefore not the same light spoken of here in this chapter, but it is a natural representation of it. Whether John is speaking metaphorically or not is unknown. However, this light does have a representation as light as we know it and understand it, and as we as, as seen by the testimony of those who have seen God in a vision. Like recently, we've seen with um, Ezekiel and other people who've seen visions uh, of God. They didn't actually see God. They saw a vision, a representation of God. And all of them see him as being as bright and shining like the sun, right? That's the one thing that stands out about him, right? Uh, and, in fact, and remember, when Jesus was transfigured in front of Peter, James, and John on the Mount of Transfiguration, it says his face showed like the sun, right? And all there was between, again, that goes back to what we were saying a minute ago, the only thing that was between that Jesus that they saw on the hill and the Jesus they'd been walking with all the time was a layer of skin. The veil. For a moment it was lifted and they could see the Jesus that had always been there. I'm going to read you just a handful of passages real quickly just to make this point more cogent for you. Habakkuk chapter 3 verse 4 says, His radiance is like the sunlight, and he has rays flashing from the hand, from his hands, and there are, therein is the hiding place of his power. I've actually seen that. That. When I was a little boy. When I got baptized in the Holy Spirit. I didn't know that but it was in the Bible. I'd never read Habakkuk. I was seven years old. I didn't know the book of Habakkuk was even there. <laughs> uh, and uh, when I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I was standing before this throne. And again, it was very, very bright. That's all you really saw. I could see maybe some arms and uh, that kind of thing, but everything else was just too bright to see. And then there was this guy that stepped down um, uh, on my right hand. Uh, I mean, so from my left hand side, uh, it was on the right hand of the guy on the throne. And he put his arms like that and out of his wrists, were shafts of light that shot out like rays of light. And the next thing I knew, I was on the on the, the, the lap of the guy on the throne. And my prayer language, part of my prayer language was Abba. I was saying over and over and I, again, didn't know what the word Abba meant. I didn't know that. I didn't know that till many years later. It was part of my prayer language. So I've been there. I've seen this, at least a representation of it. I wasn't actually there. I saw a representation of it as a vision in my mind. So, so when I, you can imagine years later when I ran across this, I'm like, wow, look at that. I didn't know that, <laughs> I didn't know that was in the Bible. So, uh, that, I thought that was pretty cool. So, Matthew chapter 17, verse 2, it says, And he was transfigured before them. This the Mount of Transfiguration. He was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his garments became as white as, as light. 2 Corinthians 4, 6 says, For God, who said, Let light shine out of darkness, is the one who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God that is in the face of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Revelation chapter 1, verse 16, In his right hand he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the, was like the sun shining in its strength. So these are just a handful of passages from the Bible that talk about God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. So there's a way in which it is a, we have a good representation here in natural world of what that probably is and what it looks like. One thing is for certain, the one meaning of light that we know for sure it's definitely referring to is knowledge. In God is perfect understanding. Because you know how light is used as a representation of understanding, of comprehension, right? If God is light, one of the meanings it means is that God is perfect understanding. In him, there's no lack of understanding at all. He has perfect knowledge. He knows everything. There's nothing that escapes his sight. Even as the Hebrew writer affirms, he said, No creature is hidden from God, but everything is naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must render an account. He sees it all and knows it all. Amen? He is omniscient. It is likely that the light spoken of here in this chapter is both literal and metaphorical. And that it is, in the spiritual realm, it's possible that there's no difference between the two. It could be that to see actual physical light in the spiritual realm is to have understanding. 
And we have a way of thinking that's possibly true because remember a few times Paul talks about how when we actually see Jesus face to face and we know what that face looks like, it looks like the sun, right? When we see him face to face, we will know even as we're known. So to see the light is to understand what that light knows. So it's very possible that in the spiritual realm, there's no difference between actual, what we would call physical light and understanding. They may be one and the same. I don't know. We'll find out when we get there. I don't know yet. But, you know, maybe we make a distinction here on earth, but in there, there may not be a distinction. However, currently, one way or the other, we know that we cannot see God as he is right now. 1 Timothy 6.16 says, He alone possesses immortality and lives in unapproachable light, whom no human has ever seen or is even capable of seeing. To him be honor and eternal power. So this is a foundational doctrine. It's a primary axiom of, of, of our faith. This passage is a little marginally difficult, but I think that the difficulty is removed for us in other passages because we know Jesus said that no man had seen God at any time. But you know that when Jesus said that, he hadn't died yet and he hadn't raised from the dead yet. So it's possible that that's, that's, it was because of it was before the um, uh, before redemption was possible. Because Matthew 5, 8 says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Right? Um, 1 Corinthians 13, 12 says, For now we see in a mirror indirectly, but then we will know and see face to face. Now I know in part, but now I, then I will know as fully as I have been fully known. Uh, 1 John 3, 2 says, Dear friends, we are God's children now, and, it had, and what will be has not been yet revealed. But we know whatever... We know that whatever it is revealed, whenever it is revealed, we will be like him because we will see him just as he is. And Revelation 22, 1 through 4 says, Then the angel showed me the river of water of life, the water as clear as crystal pouring out from the throne of God and of the Lamb, flowing down the middle of the city's main street. And on each side of the river <clears throat> is the tree of life producing 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month of the year. Its leaves are for the healing of the nations, and there will be no longer any curse. And the throne of God and the Lamb will be in the city, and His servants will worship Him, and they will, be, and they will see His face, and His name will be written on their foreheads. One day I'm going to have a tattoo right there, right? The name of God. I'll be marked by God, right? <laughs> I belong to him. Amen. Now, Woost says concerning 1 John 1, 5, this verse we're talking about, he translates it this way. He says, and it is the this message which we have heard from him and at present is ringing in our ears. And we are bringing back tidings to you that God, as to his very nature, is light and darkness in him does not exist. Not even one particle. Going on now in John chapter 1 verse 6, it says, If we say that we have fellowship with him and yet keep on walking in darkness, we are lying and not practicing the truth. You see why understanding that he is light is important. Because if you're going to have a shared experience with one who is light, you can't have darkness. Are you following? Yes? You don't mix oil and water. It doesn't work that way. Verse 7, he says, But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his Son cleanses us from all sin. All sin. Yes. Just looking at 6 where you read over it sometimes, I think, but um, it's obvious that in one way or another we all have to make this adjustment continually to go from not practicing, practicing, not practicing, practicing. Yes. But like darkness. But as Titus says here, that if we're, if we're not walking in the light, then we lie. Yeah. If we claim that we have fellowship. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and so I'm just thinking that's just one more of those aspects of the Ten Commandments that we don't think we're breaking that we are. Absolutely. Yeah. That's right. And, and the, the worst part about it is that a lot of Christians deceive themselves into thinking they have fellowship with God when they're still walking in their flesh. They know they've got sin in their life they haven't dealt with. And yet they believe they have fellowship with God. What's worse is their pastor affirms to them that they have fellowship with God. And yet here, this says, if we say we have fellowship with God and yet keep on walking in darkness, we are lying. 
and not practicing the truth. Now, it's these hard phrases that we need to be face to face with. You know what I mean? And because other, I mean, you, you know, it's easy to get caught up in emotions. And when you get a caught up in emotions, you can convince yourself that something that's true is not true. You can convince yourself that I'm having fellowship with God when in fact you know you're walking in darkness. And this says here, you're lying to yourself. You are not having fellowship with him. Are you following me? Now, does he say there that you're not his son and his daughter? No, he didn't say that. He said you're not having a shared experience with him right now, in this moment. Well, I need to have a shared experience with him every moment if I have any hope of being transformed into the image of Jesus Christ. I cannot afford too many moments of not having fellowship. How about you? Right? I need it all the time. That means I need to be dealing with this darkness bit. Yes, ma'am. Can we attain to a point where we have absolutely no sin on this side? No, ma'am. No, that's not going to happen. The reason why I know that is because First John says anybody who is living and says that they have no sin is lying. So how can we... I'm going to talk to that. Very good. Okay. No, it's good. I, want, I like you asking questions because you're thinking. This is good. This is not <laughs> talking about sinless perfection. It's talking of walking in the light that you have. You don't know everything. And you're not going to know everything. You're still looking through a glass dimly. And this isn't talking about the fa an idea that you never mess up, that you never fall into sin from time to time. We're talking about, uh, you know, if you've got a besetting sin in your life and you're doing very little about it and you fall all the time and you're not seeing any progress in that, well, then, yeah, you've got a real problem here. Because you're not, you're not, it, most of the time you're probably not walking in fellowship except for the few seconds between you asking for forgiveness and the time, next time you screw up. That's not a lot of fellowship time. You know what I mean? That, that not, that's, and, and I've told you before, that's not normal for Christian. That's not the normal Christian life. I know that that's being sold today as, well, everybody's got besetting sins and everybody, you know, regularly gives into a particular sin and, and God knows that and you're good. And well, they're right about God knows that, but they're wrong about you're good. That's not normal. That's abnormal. If a child is born and has got three arms, we know that's not the norm. I don't think something evil of the child, but it's got three arms. It's not normal. Right? If you as a child of God are habitually falling into the same pattern of sin, you're an abnormal child. The problem is that, that the abnormal has become the new norm. And it's because this isn't taught. Are you following me? It is abnormal for a Christian to fall into sin. It's abnormal. And one of the reasons why we live in it, we allow it, is because we buy the lie that, well, I guess that's normal. And so we never aspire to more. You see what I'm saying? But, you know, th there's more there. And again, it's not going to happen if you don't require it. That means I'm going to have to climb up on that cross with him and suffer a death and fellowship in the middle of that suffering. And that is not a, se a message that sells well in today's market. You know what I'm saying? People want to hear that. People want to know. Don't, people want to know. People want to be affirmed in their sin. I want to know that Jesus still loves me. Well, He does still love you. He doesn't like you so much, but He loves you. He doesn't like what you're doing. He hates what you're doing. Right? Not, not only because of its effect on you, He hates it. Period. It's contrary to Him. It's disgusting to Him. It's abnormal to Him. And He won't have fellowship with it. He will not. But can he change you? Oh, absolutely. That's what the whole death and burial and resurrection was about. It wasn't just to forgive me of sin. It was to rid the power of sin over me so it no longer lords over me. I can literally walk free from sin. That's the normal, right? And so the answer of your question is it doesn't mean sinless perfection on this side of the grave. What it means is a person who their their default temperament is they are always doing what is right. Every once in a while, they 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 screw up. You know, they they they, they through whatever means the devil's able to trip them up from time to time because they're still human, they're still subject to error, and they're going to fall. But on their every day, the most normal thing is 
They don't, they don't do those things. That's what's normal for them. That's what he's talking about. You're what, and that only applies to the things that you know. You can't walk in the light of things you don't know because it's not like you yet. Amen? So he says, if I'm walking the light to the same degree that Christ is walking the light, then I can have fellowship with him. And his blood is covering all that stuff that I don't know that's wrong that I do all the time. Because there's a lot of stuff we do that we don't know is wrong. Amen? Aren't you glad that his, his blood covers that? I'm so grateful that I don't have to reach sin <laughs> perfection in order to have fellowship. Amen? But what I needed to do is I do need to be responsible over what I do know. Amen? And submit that to his lordship and allow him to work that perfection through me. You have had something a minute ago, Terry. Just thinking about um, the you said abnormal to a Christian to fall into sin or to leave sin. Not to fall into sin, but to, to have a habitual pattern of sin. Right. Um, I was just thinking how we do, like you said, the culture, the world around us doesn't think that, and we get desensitized. Yeah. We get desensitized to things when we fellowship with the world and the culture mm -hmm. that is around us, and into thinking that that things are not sin at all, or okay with moving. Yeah, okay. you're right. And, and that fellowship, again, is warning, you know, don't be fellowship with the world, be fellowship with me. Yeah. Because the more we are in fellowship with him, the more we are going to be aware, the more we are going to be sensitive to what is right in him. Yeah. But in light of what he shows us. That's right. Absolutely. You know, um, that just maintaining that fellowship Walk in the light as you already have it. That right there, that is the big, that's that's this, the thing that we're dealing with all this morning is that next step. The next step uh, as far as relational knowledge is not getting more knowledge, but just be faithful of the knowledge you have. More will be given to you. You will be crowned with life because, why? Because that's the promise God gave to those who love him. Who are those who love him? He said, the one who loves me is one who has my word and habitually keeps it. This is the one who loves. I know your English Bible doesn't use the word habitual, but it needs to because literally that Greek word keep is in the continuous present. It means they have kept it, they are keeping it, and they'll be keeping it in the future. It's a habit with these people. That's what it means. When he said I, that those who love me are those who have my words and keep it, the word means and keep it as a habitual pattern of their life. It's abnormal for them not to keep it. That's the one that loves me. Well, I know that. That's, that makes sense, doesn't it? If I'm willing to, because in order to be that guy, I'm going to have to suffer some. I'm going to have to say no to my flesh a lot of times that it wants to do something else. And if I'm willing to suffer in order to honor him, well, you bet I love him. It's, it's a common sense statement. You and I could have written that statement. We didn't need Jesus to tell us. It's obvious. Those who love me are those who have my words and treasure it enough and it means enough to them and they value it enough that they make it a habitual pattern of their life to keep it. That one loves me. And notice, thank you, God, the next part of that phrase there in John, in, in, in John chapter 14, 15, it says, and whoever loves me, we will come and make our home with him and we will manifest ourselves to him. You're going to know him more. If you're faithful over what you got, more will be given. Amen? So if I want to pursue knowing Christ more, then I need to be faithful of what I've already been given of him. Amen? I need to cherish that and be willing to do and put through and go through anything and everything that is necessary until that character trait of Christ has been made perfect in me. I've been transformed into that likeness. Right? That endurance produces approved character, right? And what does proved character produce? More hope. Now Christ is going to be revealed to me again. And now i got a new image to have formed in me. Amen? And you know, and you can make this a quick process or a slow process. That's up to you. You can be on the fast track to the image of Christ or you can take decades to get one, part of, one character trait of Christ in you. It's up to you. Your growth will go as fast as you want it to. How hungry are you? Well, that depends on what cost you're willing to pay. That's how hungry you are, right? It's true. That's true of me as it is anybody else. This isn't just true for you guys. <laughs> it's true for 
for anybody in the body of grace. I don't care who you are, right? Now, um, I wanted to go into Romans, but we just don't have a lot of time. So, um, because I, I, I know that we're all tired and it's uh, the the whole leap forward bit. Um, let me just wrap this part up right here, and then we'll we'll start probably next week in Romans. So, the fellowship that we are to enjoy with God requires that we walk in the light of what we know of Him already. Knowing Him may come at a cost, but it is but His dividends are overwhelming and glorious. The cost of suffering. The, the cost of this is suffering. And, and and perhaps there's probably no better chapter in the Bible that specifically deals with suffering as a topic than Romans chapter 8, which is where we will go next week um, in our pursuit of knowing Christ more. Amen? But this week, the one thing that we learned for certain is that I need to be faithful over the Jesus I already know. I don't need to be petitioning the, the throne of heaven and say, God, reveal more of Jesus to me if I'm not even walking in the light of the Jesus I already know. Amen? So just go ahead and make use of that. Eat what's on your on your plate, and then you'll get dessert, right? But, you know, until you've cleared your plate, I'm not giving you nothing else. And I go to, remember, I told you, that's not necessarily a hard, fast rule. God is sovereign. He can give you more if he chooses. But I think that by and large, it's probably the truth. Why give you more when you're not going to be faithful what he's already given you? Amen? So are you going to be faithful with that? Yes? Yes. Okay, I'm going to, I'm going to pursue and I'm going to worship God. Because, I mean, what he's revealed of Christ to me is glorious. It's worthy of worship. It's worthy of praise. And just spend time admiring him. Get a vision in your mind of that attribute in Christ. And just spend time worshiping him and admiring that attribute. And telling him, Father God, I thank you that you are perfecting that image of Christ in me. I know I don't look that way right now. But Lord, I know that you're perfecting that in me. Even right now. Even as I'm worshiping you. And I know the enemy's going to fight this. I know he's going to give opposition. But I know that greater is me, he who is in me than he is in the world. I know that you are able to perfect that which you started in me. I trust you. I trust you. I believe that the Christ that you revealed to me, you didn't reveal it to me in vain. You revealed it because you fully expected and knew that I would become like that image. And so I'm just worshiping you and I'm thanking you that you're forming that image of Christ in me. You see what I'm saying? Just doing that. Spending time with that. That's not hard, is it? And and keep and, and stay sensitive to the Spirit of God by praying in the Spirit regularly and worshiping God and keeping attuned to Him because that way, when the enemy comes and he's gonna come, when he comes, you'll be able to count it joy. But if he blindsides you and it hits you and you weren't ready, you're gonna be paying attention to the temptation, to the trial, to the opposition, and God forbid you might even be offended that it came, rather than counting it joy. Right. Because if you count it joy, then what you're doing is you're building an expectation. I know what's going on here. I know you don't think I do, devil, but I know what's going on here. You're trying to get me to not believe this. You're trying to get me to sidestep this because you know that if I press through that, that image is mine. I'm this, this far away from that being perfected in me, and I'm not buying your garbage. I'm not buying it. I am not buying it. And that's all you need to say to him. If you say anything at all, you may not even say that. Just ignore him, you know? Turn your attention towards God. Just start worshiping him all the more. Just say, Papa, I am excited. You know what just happened? The devil tried to tell me that what you revealed to me is a lie. <laughs> and you know what that means? It means I'm this close to that being perfected in me. I just am so, I'm so excited, God. I'm worshiping you and I'm so thankful that Christ is about to be formed to me in another area. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You see what I'm saying? Instead of doing this, oh, I've done it again. I swear, it's just always like this. It, no, see, you just lost it. Serpent's on the pole right there. Look at it, right? And allow Christ to be perfected in you. Do you have something, Terry? I don't want to lose what you're doing. No, 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 no. Yeah, we're wrapping down. Well, what I'm just saying, what, what you were just explaining as, as, as life, but also is reminding us of what we need to think about and do and an and example of how we need to play this out in our life. Yeah. Keeping that, you know, as well, uh, because I was just going to throw out an idea because uh, the people who like assignments, mm -hmm. um, of just either 
you're writing down or at least thinking about three things every day that you do know what the life you already have mm -hmm. and just writing down those things and kind of spending a little time just thinking about them for the day or whatever absolutely and just focusing on three I mean chances are kind of like the whole 15 minute rule and we're into one hour and a half yeah. but you start with the little one and then let's down right. so you know just just challenge yourself this week every day write down at least three just just focus on three to five things that you know about God the knowledge that he's already given you, that you thank him for, that you can meditate and get in your mind a little bit. Amen. Even if it's just for a few seconds, it just gets your your your, your thought primed. Yeah, and it needs to be points of worship, just worshiping God for the beauty of what's been revealed to you, and know that that beauty belongs to you as well. Not just does it belong to you because it's Him and He, it, as crazy as that is, He belongs to you. But that image belongs to you because it belongs, you're predestined to bear that image. That belongs to me. That's mine. That's my inheritance. The devil can't take that from me. It's my inheritance. Right? That picture of Christ in me is mine. That belongs to me. He can't take that. Amen? So, you know, if you're going to be ten tenacious about something, be tenacious about that. Dig your heels in and say, no, that is mine. What did Jesus say? He says, you know, that the, um, he says that, uh, um, I forget the exact wording of it, forgive me, but, but it talks about uh, uh, the kingdom of God and that the violent take it by force. It means that you lay hold on it. I lay hold on that for which Christ Jesus has laid hold on me. I don't just limply lay back like a rag and we'll grab, Jesus laid hold on me and just wait to be dragged around someplace. No, I reach back and I grab hold of him. Right? If you're, if you're drowning in the water and someone reaches down and grabs you, don't 